Okay, so so today we are going to have the first of two parts um, of, a, of a series called Our Values in Theory and in Practice. My name is Dan Spiro. I'm the president of the Jewish Islamic Dialogue Society of Washington. Um, I want to thank you all for coming. Um, we have really two exciting panelists to get this started. The first session is going to be about Judaism. And the second session is going to be about Islam. And that will be either in December or January. We have not um, come up with a precise date yet. And so um, I'm going to introduce the panelists. And I want to just, I'll, I'll introduce you one at a time. And then and I'll start out with uh, Rabbi Schneier, who I think is going to get started. And then after he finishes, I'll introduce the other panelists. So Rabbi David Schneier is the founder, director, and spiritual leader of the Am Kolel Jewish Renewal Community of Greater Washington, and he is also the Rabbi Emeritus of Kahila Kadasha, which is a Montgomery County-based Havara. He is the past president of, of Ohala, the Rabbi uh, Rabbinic Association of Jewish Renewal Rabbis, and he's an accomplished musician and musical composer on any given uh, Shabbat service, you're probably, in this city at least, you'll probably hear his version of Shalom Alechem all over the city. Um, Rabbi David helped found um, Jewish United, uh, Jews rather, United for Justice, and he is active in various social justice organizations and really um, one of the go-to activists working on uh, Middle East peace issues and other social justice issues in the Washington area. So uh, Rabbi David, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> uh, you need to give me a copy of that introduction. Uh, that would be great. Um, I'd like to just share a few words about my uh, earlier story. Uh, I grew up on a poultry farm in uh, New Jersey, uh, near a, a town called Lakewood, um, which had one of the largest yeshivas in the world uh, based there at, at the time still is um, many of the yeshiva and, and a yeshiva is kind of like a Jewish monastery by the way you mentioned monastery before it's kind of like a you know a monastery for Jews anyway but uh, many refugees from uh, from Europe um, you know uh, because of the Holocaust uh, found their way to Lakewood and where uh, those students were able to continue to study um, uh, there was also a reform temple you know in town and uh, my parents um, who were more culturally Jewish. My father actually was very devout, but he was a devout atheist. Um, my, uh, my, uh, my mother more from a more cultural background, but very rooted you know, in Jewish traditions. They founded a conservative synagogue uh, in, in Lakewood. There was none at the time. So I was exposed to all these three branches. Those are the major branches of Judaism. And there are other branches, uh, renewal, there's the reconstructionist movement, there's a Jewish humanist movement. And I'm starting out by saying that because, um, you know, in this conversation that we're having today, just to understand that there are, as there are in other traditions, spiritual traditions, faith traditions, there are denominations, branches, movements, um, uh, my, uh, my, my grandparents, I just like to uh, kind of uh, honor them and just uh, say they were very involved in a, the Jewish workers movement and uh, some of the values that, um, that I have uh, come from that tradition of, you know, fighting for workers' rights and just uh, against injustice in general. Um, growing up, I loved the uh, sense of community and uh, the services. Um, the, religious services and, and the learning. Um, certain core values uh, came through, mainly through the holidays, I would say, uh, holiday celebrations, especially Hanukkah and uh, Passover, celebrations of, uh, of freedom. Um, uh, also in the family, just a love for family and a love for learning. These were like so instilled within me from a very uh, young age. Um, but in high school, I was I was drawn to um, uh, other teachers and presentations of Judaism and Jewish values, um, more universal teachings. And, um, I had been exposed mostly to the more, I guess, particularistic uh, traditions in the culture. 
uh, but these universal teachings and uh, concerns of Judaism, thinkers such as Abraham Joshua Heschel and Martin Buber uh, deeply, deeply influenced me. Raise your hands if you if you've heard of Heschel and Buber. Raise your hands. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> So, you know, in the Torah, you know, which is our most sacred, sacred text, um, uh, we see uh, these parallel paths, um, sometimes competing paths of universalism and particularism. In our sacred uh, text, the Torah uh, from Genesis, uh, you know, the creation story, the, uh, the, and the emergence of humanity, and also the universal covenant, you know, after the flood, the rainbow covenant, uh, we see, you know, this emphasis on universalism. Later in Exodus, we, we learn of a, a more particular uh, covenant, a more um, a unique path, you know, where a particular people is then uh, in a special relationship with, uh, with God or with the divine. Um, so we have, you know, these, these two paths, you know, and sometimes they do conflict with each other or, you know, run into each other, but they are parallel. And, um, and I find uh, that I am... Uh, I'm fine with both. I am so happy that there's the universal path. Uh, and we have two philosophers in Judaism who um, also represent, you know, uh, these, well, there are more than two. But in the Middle Ages, we have Maimonides, who is more of the universalist school. And then um, Yehuda Halevi, also of Spain, from the more, you know, particularistic uh, school. Um, sometimes we'll call it maybe a more chauvinistic, I guess, kind of uh, presentation or understanding. Uh, in Judaism, we have the written Torah, um, as many of you know, but we also have the oral Torah. And um, the uh, definition of Judaism that I've come to really appreciate comes from Mordechai Kaplan, the founder of Reconstructionist Judaism, formerly a, an Orthodox Jew, uh, is that Judaism is the evolving religious civilization of the Jewish people. Evolving religious civilization of the Jewish people. And we've evolved because of the oral Torah. And the written Torah in Judaism and the oral Torah are considered by our rabbinic tradition uh, equal. Okay, And that tradition uh, continues. And Rabbi Gila later will uh, help us understand just how that, that tradition is uh, presenting itself uh, today. Um, so in the Torah, you know, in the universal tradition, which in, in, in many of our faith traditions, we, we really do share um, in the first chapter in Genesis. And this is verse 27, if you want to follow along, if you have a Bible nearby. Um, so it says, so God created uh, Adam, which means a human, a human in God's own image. In the image of God, uh, they created, they were created, the first human, male and female, God created them. Um, so each human being, the, what I take from this, each human being is a representative of the creator, you know, within the creation, and each, uh, each in his, her own unique uh, way. Um, the Jewish sages uh, have taught uh, anyone who takes a single life, it is as though he has destroyed the entire world, and anyone who takes a saves a single life, it is as though he has saved the entire world. Now, I know this is also a, a quote I've heard from uh, my Muslim brothers and sisters from the Quran. Um, so, so same that, verse. I'm it sorry. Is the same, it is the same verse. The same verse, the same yes. verse. Okay, so, uh, so that's beautiful. And, uh, and also from the Torah, I, you know, I, was have been and continue to be drawn to the Torah because of the Torah lessons um, uh, about human dignity. I mean, there are verses here and there you, you begin to wonder, but at its heart, you know, is a deep concern for human dignity, um, that all people are deserving of, of, of being treated with dignity. In Leviticus, this comes across very strongly, you know, and this is another traditions as well, love your neighbor you know, as, as yourself. Um, if a city is under siege and its enemy declares, give us one of yours and we will leave you alone, what is the right thing to do? Well, our sages taught that we are not permitted to hand over an instant life, even to save many more lives, um, because the Torah does not permit us to take an innocent life, even for the benefit of, of many. Um, you know, in, in our tradition, uh, there we can organize our relationship uh, in life uh, with three um, cognitive three levels. There's what's called, um, uh, 
Adam Lamakom, between an individual, a person, a human, and Hamakom, which means God, you know, Ben Adam Lachavero, between a person and another individual, another person, Ben Adam Lachmo, and between a person and oneself, and oneself. So these three levels of um, of relationship, of con concern. So in the Torah and in our tradition, we have ways, practices, you know, where we can manifest, live out, you know, those relationships. So we find, you know, you know, Ben Adam Lamakom. This is where we do rituals and prayers, and we call the prayers like Avodat Halev, the service of of the heart. Um, so that's that's essential. Ben Adam Lachavero between ourselves and other other human beings, um, and it doesn't distinguish between Jewish and you know and others. I mean, others. Um, we have all these amazing teachings about social justice, how we treat uh, the stranger. Uh, the mitzvah that's mentioned most, mitzvah means a right action, it's also translated as commandment, that's mentioned most in the Torah some 36 times, is to be welcoming to, to the stranger. Um, another major teaching several times in the Torah, to take care of those who are in need, the orphan, the widow, those who are um, less fortunate. Um, we learn from Leviticus 19, do not stand idly by the blood of your neighbor. Do not put a stumbling block before the blind. Pay your workers on time. Be impartial in judgment and so on. Um, it's really taking, worth taking a look at Leviticus 9 verses 1 through 18. Um, so that, you know, so that's ben adam l'chaviro, between a person and another human being. Um, but I want to expand on that a little bit because it's not only about, um, there's also social justice in the Torah, but so much about eco-justice, uh, environmental ethics. We are, from the second chapter of Genesis, Adam is to be a shomer, a, a guardian of the earth, a guardian of the earth. So we have these really important teachings about our relationship to the earth, which has become much more prominent, you know, in recent, in, in recent years. And in Judaism today, uh, maybe Gila will talk about this a little later, but we see the emergence of Jewish environmental organizations. Uh, there's several now. Um, you know, so we have here, we're stewards of the earth. The Shabbat itself is a day of when we are at harmony, in harmony with the earth. We don't plow, we don't you know, plant, we, you know, we don't cut things, we don't do any of that. We're supposed to be in harmony with the earth, not even pulling a flower or a blade of grass. That's kind of um, to be in harmony with nature. And then every seventh year, last year was a, a seventh year. In the Torah, it says, let the land lie fallow, you know, eat what grows naturally. And there, you know, the more teachings surrounding that, you know, but what an incredibly radical concept. There are these radical environmental concepts that come right from, you know, our scriptures, the, um, the, the Torah and the Hebrew Bible. Um, back to Ben Adam Latzmo, you know, how we, uh, well, we're also called upon to take care of ourselves. And how do we do that? Through learning, through personal growth, through being in community, through celebration, through song. All this, you know, um, is also uh, integral uh, to uh, Judaism. Um, wrestling with God, you know, is a very important part of that concept. We're invited to wrestle with God. Uh, we see examples of this, or to even argue with God. In last week's portion in the Torah, Abraham is arguing with God. You know, God wants to destroy, you know, the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, you know, for their wickedness, whatever. And what, what was their main sin? They weren't welcoming to the stranger, to those who need, you know. And, and, and Abraham, you know, he's, he's bothered by this. How can you destroy the, this entire city? What if there are 50 righteous people? What if... Uh, and he couldn't find 50. What if there are 40? Well, he couldn't find 40. Four, and they, they, they worked their way all the way down to 10. And it just was like, you know, but the idea that he is wrestling with God, he has this conversation, more than a conversation, you know, he's actually bargaining with God. I mean, how many of us has ever, have ever bargained with God? You know, and then later on in the Torah, in the story of Jacob, Jacob wrestling with the angel, you know, and the name Yisrael, Israel, means one who wrestles with God and with and with uh, and with others, with humans. Um, so, just to give an idea, Moses. Moses was a great wrestler, um, and he also would stand up to God every so often if he wasn't happy with uh, how God was getting so angry with the people. Um, there, you know, around the, uh, the the golden calf story, you'll find uh, examples of that. So, 
another you know major value, core value of teaching in Judaism comes from the prophetic tradition and the, from the Torah, and then expanded upon by the Hebrew prophets. Uh, social justice. Um, in the book of Deuteronomy, we you know tzedek tzedek tir dov, justice, justice you shall pursue. It's emphasized, you know, throughout the Torah. You know, tzedek umishpat ashira, uh, chesed umishpat ashira from the Psalms, all throughout the Psalms. You know, justice is emphasized, and the righteousness of, the, of people are, are, you know, is honored, is emphasized. Um, so that's uh, that deeply influenced me as I was uh, growing up, especially in college during the anti-Vietnam War days. And I started on campus. I started an organization, a Jew Jewish Fellowship for Action, because the uh, the the local Hillel organization didn't want to get involved in politics. You see, so I created another student organization, um, students from Rutgers and also Douglas. Anyone go to Rutgers? Anyone go to Douglas here? Um, and uh, we created this organization. We organized uh, protests on campus, and uh, and we also went into the synagogues in the Washington, in the Washington, in the Raritan Valley, New Jersey area, and we spoke. We spoke from this voice of the Hebrew prophets from our Torah against um, the war in Vietnam and what that represented. Um, uh, moving on, I, I know the time is very short. Uh, we're taught by the uh, by the prophets also to be a light unto the nations, or like William, to be an example. Um, the land of Israel, we have this incredible connection historically to Eretz Yisrael, to the land of Israel, to its sacredness and uh, and all that it represents in the in the in, in the history and the growth of our people. And we also note, you know, um, I certainly note note maybe more seriously than some of my uh, brothers and sisters um, from maybe other movements in Judaism. Um, in Genesis 12, Genesis 12, where it talks about how the land is promised to Abraham's descendants. Well, Abraham's descendants include the uh, you know the children of Isaac and the children of Ishmael. You see, so you know that's a very you know so that really means something uh, to me and and the work that I do. Tikkun olam, you've uh, probably heard the term, means to repair the world. And this also is uh, an important value concept in Judaism that has taken even more prominence uh, in uh, in Jewish life over the years, um, especially the past, I would say, 40 years when it became a even more popular term. Uh, to seek peace and pursue it, you know, teachings from the Psalms, and from the Talmud of love and justice, I will sing, you know, to envision and work towards a messianic age. You know, these are important teachings. Uh, we see the, the words of the prophets, um, Isaiah and Micah, you know, you know, on the UN building, and some of you, maybe all of you know this, this already, where it says, you shall beat your swords into plowshares, your spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not live up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. So, um, so these are the, as I, you know, the, the values, the core values of Judaism, you know, and they're manifest, you know, different levels with different intensity in different movements. Um, you know, sadly, you know, um, you know, it's, uh, I mean, there are differences, you know, um, of opinion and people sometimes draw on the same teachings as you, as you might know from your own traditions and find, you know, um, a different way, see a different way of understanding. So I'm going to hold it there and turn it over to my colleague, um, colleagues. Okay, uh, so let me introduce uh, our next speaker, Rabbi Gila. Thank you very much, Rabbi David. We'll be hearing from you more very soon. <laughs> um, sorry, Rabbi Gila Langner is the rabbi at Pol Ami, uh, the Northern Virginia Reconstructionist Community in Arlington, if I'm not mistaken. She has previously served as the rabbi of Sharat HaNefesh in Chevy Chase. She was the principal of Shorashim Hebrew School and uh, Kehila Kadasha Hebrew School. We heard now Kehila Kadasha mentioned twice. She has been a visiting chaplain or an adjunct professor at various area universities. And she is the founding publisher and co-editor of a journal called Harem Creative Explorations in Judaism. What a fascinating title. So Rabbi Gila, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dan. And thank you everybody for taking time on this 
uh, Sunday afternoon, cold and delicious Sunday afternoon to uh, to be together. So um, Rabbi David's uh, summary is just fabulous of um, the high and lofty goals that and values that Judaism has had um, and continues to have. Of course, our record of compliance is a whole lot lower. Um, as you would expect with human beings anywhere, right? All you have to do is look at the end of the book of Exodus, as uh, David alluded to with the golden calf story, or most of the entire book of Numbers in the Torah. So even when the Israelites had just witnessed, they had just been freed from, from Egypt and this mighty crossing of the sea, according to the tale, and they had just witnessed God's presence on Mount Sinai. 40 days later, they're busy building a golden calf. Ouch, <laughs> kind of a, a real letdown, right? And then a story after story in the book of Numbers um, about challenges to authority and about grumbling over the conditions in the desert. So we have a full record of just how hard it is to live on a spiritual high plane. And um, I think it's a very profound tradition that um, invites us to look at it with open eyes and to discuss it every year as we read the same stories over and over again. We don't shy away from witnessing and trying to explore and understand our, our backsliding um, in the desert and, and in, in current life. So we are fully human. We, like every people, we sometimes try and fail to live up to our best values. And sometimes it seems like some of us aren't even trying at all. So, um, We've never really thought, you know, when you think about um, uh, the rabbis tried to encapsulate all of the laws and traditions and teachings and values of Judaism into a pithy soundbite. Uh, and so the one I think that won out, well, it was in the top three contenders, was the from the prophet Micah in the book of Micah, who said, what you know, human being, what is asked of you only to do justice, to love mercy and to walk humbly with God. Uh, so we've never thought of that as asking too much of us, uh, or it's and it's not a cudgel to beat ourselves up with, uh, but it's aspirations on an ongoing basis. But I would say today in, in both Israel and America, where the two largest concentrations of Jews uh, live, uh, Jewish values are bumping up against realities we haven't really encountered before. Certainly in Israel, it's been 2,000 years since we've had a polity, and even then we were not autonomous in our own in our own land. Uh, and so you have to go back even further uh, to find a time when Jews were actually uh, governing their people in their own land. And so it is an unprecedented situation uh, where in Israel you have uh, uh, people traumatized by hundreds of years of of living in a sort of an abnormal situation uh, and then of course the holocaust um, dealing with power and autonomy uh, and strength for the first time in thousands of years and um, it is a, a definitely a challenge i'm not going to spend time on that i think this group is probably very familiar with uh the situations and the the achievements and the and the um, difficulties and the uh, really severe problems going on in Israel. Um, so I, I'm going to leave that be uh, right now. But I want to talk a little bit more about America because uh, that's also a different situation than Jews have ever encountered. It is a different diaspora situation. I think you'd have to go back to the golden age of Spain uh, to find a time when Jews uh, lived with Christians and Muslims in in uh, in harmony. But even then, even in Spain, Jews were not really uh, equal in the way that we understand that now in America or since the Enlightenment uh, as having individual uh, equal rights in the civic sphere. Uh, that was not even the case back then. Uh, and so we are in a very different situation than we've ever been. Um, 
I listened to uh, Rabbi Yehuda Kurtzer last week, who said that for Jews in America, um, the great project of the 20th century, since most of the Jews who arrived in America, they came between 1880 and 1920, and their great project uh, was, was to achieve assimilation into America, which I laugh at because, of course, uh, rabbis are not really keen on, on Jews assimilating away into uh, the broader society. Um, rabbis hope that Jews will keep hold of, of our values and traditions and customs. Um, but in many ways, assimilation really was the project. Uh, and it was uh, uh, for, for Jews who, who arrived here primarily from, from Russia and uh, lands adjacent to Russia uh, from Eastern Europe. Um, becoming part of a of a more universalist society achieving uh economic comfort and wealth was was a dream come true right after after centuries of of being uh second third class citizens uh of living in abject poverty um they were keen to to change their economic circumstances uh, and so I think that you see, saw a lot of um, over time as Jews succeeded in America, you saw uh, an emphasis on materialism, perhaps um, an emphasis on excess consumerism and status consciousness um, that were the response, the adjustments of Jews to, uh, to this totally newfound freedom of, of economic opportunity. If you recall, Jews in Russia in the Pale of Settlement had very few opportunities open to them. They could not really own land, right? Jews have always been in Europe have been prevented from owning land. And so they were limited to a very few occupations. Uh, and coming to America unleashed uh, a tremendous pent-up desire to uh, be a part of uh, of the economic uh, of the economy and um, and to achieve um, economic security. Um, I think it, some of that and some of that we saw in the excesses of uh, just to give some examples, the excesses of bar and bat mitzvah ceremonies in America, right? That became a kind of, a, you know, the bar mitzvah or bat mitzvah is the coming of age ceremony for a boy or girl uh, at age 12 or 13. And um, we saw this, especially in the 80s and 90s, I think, really excessive uh, displays of, of, of uh, of uh, wealth and and uh, just going totally overboard um, on on parties for for a young teenager, uh, and and they were really demonstrations, I think, of the parents' desire to be seen as being uh, having arrived. Right? Um, I think the rabbis and and the Jewish community pushed back on that and relatively successfully. I wouldn't say that there still are not uh, some of these. Uh, bar bat mitzvah parties that have gone overboard, but it's much less so, much less the case these days. Um, so I think there has been a kind of a peaking of that uh, status consciousness in that, those ways. Um, perhaps, Dan, you might disagree and you still find some of that, but I'm not invited to the best party, so I don't know. But I think that some of that excess has been curbed. But I'd like to also say that America and the experience of America has reshaped Jewish values. And there's been a really interesting um, kind of uh, synchronicity of, uh, of Jewish values uh, in this time um, in America. Because, of course, America has been undergoing tremendous change in the last 50 years as well. Uh, as much as some folks would like to roll that time, that clock backward, uh, we've witnessed in our own lifetimes, for many of us, uh, tremendous changes in the um, in the situation of, for example, win women in society, and that sparked uh, uh, back and forth with Jewish uh, society as well as Jews in the. Uh, non-Orthodox parts of Judaism achieved uh, gender equality in Judaism 
so before, so we had the first bat mitzvah, the first coming of age for a, a Jewish um, uh, teenager back in 1922, I believe. I think this was the hundredth year of the first bat mitzvah. Um, but it never really was much of a ceremony or, or a practice until uh, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, it began, and um, and now it's completely taken for granted that Jewish girls will have a bat mitzvah, just as Jewish boys have a bar mitzvah, uh, and we have the rise of of um, of, uh, uh, of female rabbis and and Jewish women in all parts of the Jewish world, uh, in the public world, uh, and so I think you see that, that what we would if we would say is a Jewish value of equality that we on the progressive side of Judaism read from Genesis uh, one that to male and female God created uh, the first humans in the image of God, but we would say that now finally we are seeing that come true uh, and um, and that's been an enormous uh, positive value. Pluralism is a great Jewish and American value and uh, uh, I think America has been wonderful for us that way where we are able to have as, as Rabbi David mentioned uh, all kinds of denominations across the spectrum uh, and that that fits in America very comfortably. Uh, and also to echo uh, Rabbi David's words, there's been an incredible emphasis on tikkun olam, on repairing the world as a Jewish value. That was primarily championed by the reform movement in, uh, in America, but it has become a central element, I would say, of all of the uh, non-Orthodox uh, movements in Judaism, uh, fixing the world in all different kinds of ways. It's, it's become a paramount value. And some of our practices have evolved here in America. So I want to take one specific little practice and just open that up a little bit for everyone. Um, so you can kind of get a sense of how things shift back and forth. So the, the custom I want to look at is the custom of sitting Shiva. Now Jews have a very elaborate set of, of traditions around death of what is done afterwards in the morning process after a person's death. Uh, and um, uh, sitting Shiva is the ritual, the main ritual practice uh, that meant for seven days, Shiva means seven. So for seven days following the death of a loved one, those who are in mourning, the family around uh, of the deceased, uh, would be completely taken care of. They would be sitting Shiva and the community would take care of them. The community would make food for them. The community would uh, come to the house of mourning to hold the daily services so that they could stay put and did not have to venture out. Um, and so instead of, there is even rules about how you shouldn't engage the person who is mourning in conversation. You just sit there and let them talk on what's on their mind, right? Um, not to distract them from their grief uh, and not to substitute your own thoughts and feelings for theirs, but to truly be there in empathy and sympathy uh, and in support. And the whole idea was to give honor, uh, comfort to the mourners, but also very importantly, give honor to the dead. So that even if a person dies without family, the Jewish custom was that the, that the 10 people in the community would come and sit Shiva uh, for that, that person who had died. Uh, and there was sort of a, a, not only was the mourner helped through this time, but the community was in a sense reshaped, uh, reconfigured after this loss. Um, and uh, And everybody would, hopefully slowly re return to normal after this seven day period. But in America, many pieces of these rituals have been turned upside down. So instead of people taking care of the mourners, the mourners land up feeling that they need to order a big platter to take care of all the people who come to visit them because they've sort of interpreted it as that they are 
in a sense, bizarrely entertaining, right? They have all these people coming to their home, so they've got to feed them. I, that was never, ever remotely the thought um, in, the, in the past. And so what happens when people start eating uh, and talking is it becomes almost like a party. And that is uh, also absolutely uh, anathema to the tradition, right? I'm not saying it's a terrible thing, but it's just exactly opposite of the atmosphere that um, the House of Shiva normally used to have. And instead of taking a week out of one's life for this kind of intensive morning to really go through this experience, people would now whittle down the seven days to three days, which is interesting. That's similar to Muslim tradition because it's it's a long time to go a whole week uh, especially if you have, feel like you have to entertain people during that week. And now people have whittled that down even just to one day um, or even just a lunch after the funeral, as if that's uh, really the essence of sitting Shiva. It's not, right? Uh, or people feel they have to get back to work or they just don't want to do anything all day long. And the community doesn't show up until the evening when everybody comes at once. Traditionally, people would come in ones and twos and threes and just sit during the day and have conversation, have rem reminiscences about the person who died. So the whole value of setting aside time and setting up rules to allow for absorbing the loss and mourning the loss has kind of been subverted. Um, as has the tradition of honoring the dead with this time period. Some mourners say, well, I don't need to sit Shiva, as if the only reason for sitting Shiva is for their own comfort. Um, that was only one of the values. The other was to honor the weight of the loss of the deceased. Now, interestingly, um, another change has happened. It's just in the last two years, and with this, I'm going to close. Um, with Zoom, because people couldn't come of, during the pandemic, could not show up in person, or didn't feel comfortable eating at people's houses. So we have the advent of the Zoom Shiva minion. And uh, so people gather on Zoom, and instead of just having chit chat around a table, you actually have the old custom of speaking about the person who died and sharing memories, and people in the in the crowd uh, on Zoom, able to share memories as well. And in some ways, it is a return uh, to the traditional custom of what Shiva was like and how it felt. Uh, and so I, I think you know, it's, it's quite fascinating to see um, how we are once again put back into the values that, that we originated with. So let me stop there and turn things back to you, Dan. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rabbi Gila. Um, I want to share something, if I can, on the screen. Can you all see it? Can you all see what, I, what I'm looking at? Three questions? Yes. Okay, um, so these are questions that I'd like us to be considering um, for the rest of the session. Um, probably best to have the personal perspectives or stories shared in small groups, but um, you've heard a lot about core Jewish values. You may have other suggestions. You've also heard something about challenges that we face. Um, and um, if you can speak candidly about those, you know, what we can do to meet these challenges, how we've done to meet these challenges, um, that would be great too. Um, I have some other specific questions that we could add to these, but I think right now I'd just like to hear some other voices and you can ask questions to the panelists or just make a statement. Uh, Dan? Go ahead, Mike. Uh, it is very fascinating to hear both the rabbi, both the rabbis. And uh, as I have mentioned for many years, I've been working with the Jewish friends, all religions in fact. Uh, there are so many similarities. And I was about to say, when she said seven days about Shiva, and when Rabbi Gila said that, I immediately said uh, three days 
in the Muslim traditions, and it is very similar that uh, people bring food. But uh, now we are doing the Zoom Shivas uh, in even in Islam. Uh, the question I had for a rabbi, both the rabbis, uh, Rabbi Schneier, what is the significance of 10, ten and what is the significance of seven for Rabbi Gila? So uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, you said the question, first question is what is the significance of what? Number 10. Of the minion. Of, of the, the number, number 10? Yeah. Oh, boy. It has um, lots of, in, the, in our tradition, um, a lot of significance. Uh, I mean, what comes Im immediately to mind are the Aseret Hadibrut, the 10 statements, the 10 commandments says it's no more popularly, but literally it means more like the 10 statements, the 10 principles. So these, um, you know, uh, according to one of the narratives in our Torah, this is what was given to Moshe, Moses, uh, at Sinai. This is the revelation. So it represents that. Um, gosh, the number 10, uh, um, in fact, it's an interesting thing because we have, you know, 10 fingers, you know what I mean? And, uh, and when I was, um, I have to just, you know, share this with you. Uh, when I was at my son's yeshiva in, um, in uh, uh, his yeshiva is located actually in a, in a settlement of 64,000 people actually in the West Bank. When I was at the yeshiva uh, last year, um, uh, the, the students there wanted to shake my hand, but I, my wife and I were the only ones who were masked. Um, and she was sitting upstairs with the other women. I was downstairs. I was the only man that was masked. And then they wanted to shake my hand to congratulate me, you know, upon uh, my son's wedding, you know. But I wouldn't shake hands because I and I still don't shake hands because hands go to mouth, the nose, whatever. So I did this. I you know I did the elbow. I said, and I said they used the word shnei luchot the two tablets of the Torah. I did this, and then I did this, you know? So each arm representing a tablet, because Moses held the tablets, you know, the luchot, they're called, luchos or luchot, held them up. So I got the whole yeshiva doing this. <laughs> and, 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 the, and when I left, the head of the yeshiva, the Rosh Yeshiva, when he said goodbye to me, you know, he also said, shnei luchos. <laughs> so it's, now, it's, a, it's, now, it's a new tradition, and in a couple of years we'll think it's a thousand years old. But uh, the number ten, uh, gosh, um, I, I know there's other significance in, in the meaning, but those, that's what jumps out immediately. Um, uh, well, Gila, Gila, do you have any other? Right. Well, so you may be also wondering why um, we call it a minion of ten people. Um, if you want to say anything about that, David. Yeah, yeah. In fact, this is from last to also last week's Torah reading because when uh, Abraham was bargaining with God over the destruction of the city, when it destroy the city, you know, it, it boiled down to ten, and it stops there. He could have said, "What? Well, what if there are five righteous people? What if there is one righteous person?" But it stopped at ten. So, uh, as I I learned um, a, a while back, well, that's where we get the idea that a community you know, has to be that number 10, minimally uh, the number 10 for a community. And of course, in most of the Jewish tradition, Jewish tradition over the years, it's it was specifically meant to refer to 10 men. Now in the non-Orthodox world, it's uh, 10 men and, and women. Um, so so that's the thank you, uh, Gila, for reminding me of that uh, sitting if it's there too. Rabbi Schneier, also, I understand that 10 uh, is reduced to 1. 1 plus 0 in numerology is, <laughs> is 1. <laughs> and it means unity also. So I think it has a very deep significance. It means, yeah, yeah, it's true. I mean, it's the first letter in the Yud Kevake, the first letter of the name of, uh, of God, okay? The, the ineffable name of God in our tradition. Uh, Yud, the letter Yud, which means is numeric value of 10, according to, um, I believe, in the Kabbalah, is the, is, is the beginning point, the point of the universe, that everything started from that point, because it's the smallest letter, and everything started from that smallest letter, the Yud, which is the, uh, it, the integral of 10. Yeah. So, Mike, you had a question about the number seven? Yes. 
Gila? Deeper. Yes. So seven is also one of those magical numbers in Judaism. Um, seven days of creation, especially, and the seventh day is the Sabbath. Uh, so seven has a sense of kind of completion of fullness. Um, and so it's, uh, it's, it's used in other things as well. For Shiva, you know, you could sort of see why a full week would be part of that, uh, that custom. Seven branch candelabrum. Right. The seven, you know, offices on, on, on the face, the eyes, the nose, the mouth, the ears. So there all those layers of meaning. The seven matriarchs and patriarchs, we wrap the phylacteries, the tefillin around our arms seven times, you know, for the meaning of eternality, but also to represent the patriarchs and the matriarchs. I think yeah. in Kabbalah also it's seven endocrine glands too. That yeah, true, and the and the seven lowers he wrote in the Kabbalah system, which is ten. There are ten emanations of the divine of divine energy in the Kabbalah, like the chakras, you know, the chakra system. So we have these ten emanations of the divine, and the lower seven are the ones that we are much more um, connected to, you know, bond, body, and spirit. The upper it's three. amazing that number seven in Islamic tradition, uh, when they go to the Mecca, the Kaaba, the cube, Muslims are supposed to go seven circles around that. And in Hindu tradition, when they take vows, the bride and the groom walk around the fire seven times. It's, it's amazing with that number seven. We have that same thing in Judaism with uh, the, the bride walks or circles the groom seven times. And on one of our holidays, when we celebrate the Torah, we do seven circles as well. So very interesting how those, yeah. Yeah. those circling that seven times, beautiful, yeah. So uh, Laura, you're muted, but you're next. Okay, so yeah. Uh, so I'm going back to your first question. Um, I, something about what, what's, what are some Jewish, basic Jewish values, was that the question? Core values, right. Core value. I mean, the first thing that came to my mind is life. And I mean, when it comes to all of the laws of, and prohibitions about what you can and can't do on the Sabbath, if it comes to saving a life, you can break any of those laws to save a life. Um, you know, l'chaim to life. Um, and it, when it comes to moral issues, though, I, I was doing this with my students this past week, we were talking about morality in different religions. And um, we were looking at a Gallup survey of Americans and, and different moral issues. And two of them so have always stood out to me, um, you know, is abortion morally acceptable or morally wrong? Is death penalty morally acceptable or morally wrong? And the curious thing is, um, I guess the more conservative folks tend to say abortion is wrong, but death penalty is okay, which seems to me like a contradiction. And then there was another pair of, of statements. Is suicide morally acceptable or morally wrong? And what about doctor-assisted suicide? Those were separated. And again, people who, there's more tendency to say suicide is wrong, but doctor-assisted suicide is okay which doesn't make sense to me because I think of doctor-assisted suicide as a subset of suicide. But I do wonder if by doctor-assisted, people may have interpreted that as euthanasia, but I think those are two different things. Well, I'll let the panel respond, but it's just a just thing that comes to my mind to hear uh, your question or your statement is that there can be multiple core values and they can rub up against each other. So somebody could say, well, I have a core value in favor of X, whether it's life or liberty or whatever, but I have another core value in favor of Y, which is why I may appear to be inconsistent when in fact, in one instance, um, I'm, I'm applying primarily one core value and in another instance, I'm, I'm applying primarily a separate core value. Anyway, if, if um, one of the rabbis want to respond uh, to Laura, David, you're muted. I think you're both muted, actually. Thanks. Uh, 
do you have a, uh, would you like to address one of her questions? They're excellent questions. Excellent um, questions. And I think uh, Dan really gave a very wise response, right? That there are multiple core values and uh, we, we all tend to interpret them in different ways. Um, but go ahead, David. Uh, on, the, on the question of, uh, of the death penalty, um, you know, it's there in, in the Torah. Uh, <clears throat> but the, um, the rabbinic tradition is very, very clear that it, it was so rare. It was so rare that it was meted out. Um, there's, there's one uh, reference that if it, if it happened once in 70 years, that was uh, amazing because it required such a level of, um, of corroboration by witnesses. And uh, there, there, just, there was so, so much that made it virtually impossible. That's why uh, there was such a turmoil in, in the state of Israel over the Eichmann trial. You know, some of you might recall that, you know, and uh, it was the only time in, the, in, in Israel's now 75, almost 75 years since, um, the, the state was declared that uh, it's the only time there was a uh, um, the death penalty was, was used. So it's really extremely rare. It's frowned upon. It's rare. Um, as far as abortion, again, you'll find you know a spectrum of of of, of teaching of responses within you know within the movements in Judaism. Um, one thing that is clear is that. Uh, the fetus, the the embryo fetus, is not considered a full human. So, the mother's life always takes precedence. You say the mother's life takes precedence. So that that is clear in cross across the line, you know. And uh, depending on any you know, I would suggest you know you know taking a moment to to Google the different responses from the different movements, because they do vary. But abortion, you know, is um, you know a uh, Call it a, a right and sometimes a necessity. Uh, you know, if, if, it's, if it's absolutely clear that, uh, um, you know, for all the reasons that we've been struggling and fighting over the past couple of years since, how long has it been since Roe Wade, you know, uh, kind of was, was, was put down by the Supreme Court, you can see um, just how it's complex. But within Judaism, there is an important acknowledgement that under certain situations, it is absolutely necessary. Rabbi David, I think your 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 statement, uh, how long has it been, is kind of a funny one because it hasn't been that long, except if you count the leak. It was oh, leaked right, before right. the opinion Six came months. out. Yeah. And, and, and yes, and we've heard about other leaks this week. So uh, no, that's not no. something many of us are used to. Um, before Nora's question, I want to point out that um, the first question that Laura, Laura addressed it, what do you understand to be the core Jewish values? Part A is of the faith, but part B is of the folk over the past century. Um, we've talked a lot about the, the core values of Judaism as a faith, but Rabbi Gila also touched on to some degree the folk. And I think that's something that we should um, we should strongly consider that Judaism. I mean, I think Rabbi David uh, used the definition from Mordecai Kaplan: an evolving religious civilization. Well, that brings into account not just the faith, but also the folk, the, the people. Um, so that's something we shouldn't forget. But anyway, um, Nora, you're next. I just put my question into the chat for everybody to see. I just put my question in the chat. Oh, um, well, let me see if I can find it and then I'll read it out loud. Um, read it for you. My observation, the core values remains very similar in all monotheistic religion. That's my observation. Okay. In Judaism, how the importance of the core values shifted among various uh, you know, denomination within the Jewish. And what was the reason of that shift? Uh, uh, I'm not sure if I heard. Um... <clears throat> I said that in, Jude, in of all the religion, the importance of 
we have a same set of core values, but certain group puts a lot more emphasis on certain core values than others. It becomes a priority stack, you know, something come first, second, third. So I want to understand how various groups within the Jewish community views those so that I have a better appreciation about certain things so that I, I, I want to have a better appreciation. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, I, I, it, all I can say is that, um, you know, we are, you know, Shutaf Lamase Rishi, we are partners, you know, with the Creator, with, with God in life. You know, we are of God. We, um, you know, and and what I mean is is that we choose. We can also choose how we wish to manifest, you know, to live, you know, those teachings. For some of us, um, there there are certain teachings that are just resonate much more deeply. You know, uh, there are those Jews who. You know, the ritual practice of Judaism, Ben Adam de Makon, is, is more important in their lives. Praying three times a day, um, you know, uh, being strictly kosher, you know, the, the rituals, you know, um, uh, are more meaningful than how we relate to our fellow human beings. Not that it's not important, but, it's, you know, because it is important, but it's not it doesn't have the same emphasis in certain parts of the Jewish community. So I choose to, you know, my own life in partnership with, with, with God, you know, to do more in the realm of social justice. You see, it doesn't make one right or wrong. I, you know, everyone has to kind of find the right balance for themselves ultimately. And this is part of what it means to us to be in dialogue you know, with the divine and, and, and with ourselves and with humanity. It's the wrestling concept of, of wrestling with God. Um, so if I can add to that, um, I think you're right. I think I would say core values across all, almost all religions um, are, are very similar. And I think that goes to the idea that the religions are trying to create a, a world, a society that functions well and that is able to sustain itself um, and gives people something to, to, to hold on to. But I would say that the same kind of dynamic happens in Judaism as in some other religions as well, where there's a tension between maintaining the community and being part of a larger consciousness of the world. And so I would say that, that you know, I, I think of it in terms of uh, those who are guardians of the tradition and those who have that prophetic sensibility that Rabbi David was talking about. And that we've always had prophets and guardians, right? And we have that um, in so many different ways. Some folks are really concerned with maintaining the tradition, the practices, the customs and the rituals and the liturgy and the, all of the wealth of, of, of civilization that has come down to us uh, and passing that on to their children and generations in the future. And some are really concerned about um, looking around the world and trying to make it better and trying to improve it and, and fix what's wrong. Right? And so there's that dual focus. Uh, I think both are important, but different groups in, in Judaism will have a different, um, different perspective, right? So reformed Jews will be much more oriented towards uh, repairing the world and much less interested in the rituals and customs. Um, and uh, the, the opposite would be among the Orthodox. Right, who are very much concerned with maintaining and preserving and passing down the traditions and are less involved in the, the larger world, the non-Jewish world. Does that help? So, so Nora, if I can address the thing you said before, Andra, who is next, um, and maybe talking a little bit is, um, we often encounter that our blank is thing 
It's when we first encounter it, we believe in the same God. Right? And, 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 and our core values are the same. There's a core truth, both of those statements, but also, if you will, a core falsity. The core truth in terms of our values being the same has to be, right, that if you're talking about what's really important to us, whether or love, it's kind of hard to argue that these are not core values. Sorry, if I'm not doing a good job of shutting down some, hold on a second. We hear a loud noise. Okay. Um, so our, our core values are, are very similar. Sounds like a stampede of uh, horses. Yeah, it's uh, somebody's unmuted and probably left the room. Um, our core values are very, very similar. But then we get into maybe, you know, values that are important to us that are sort of second level. So you heard the one today mentioned twice, wrestling with God. I'm not sure I've heard Muslims talk about themselves as God wrestlers, as opposed to people who submit, right? Um, uh, right, Rand, I could, agree we, with that. We could hear, we hear the term from our Christian brothers and sisters, the meek shall inherit the, the earth, <clears throat> which is like a different translation um, from scripture than I think the Jewish translation. We often hear about the value of chutzpah, which uh, is associated with the folk, but I think it becomes a very important value that Jewish people teach their children. Don't, don't be a lemach, was the way I, uh, my parents used to say it. Don't, don't, don't let people kick you around. Um, these are values where, as, where the rubber meets the road. Now, you may not call them core. A similar point on the theological issue. The very first JIDS meeting was at a home back at the in the beginning of 2009, and the topic was God. And I think the expectation could have been we could have listened to, you know, two speakers talk about what we call the strict monotheism of Judaism and Islam. But instead, people were sharing largely their own views with respect to God. And I thought for a minute. I was like having an out of body experience. I thought I was going to say, well, wait a minute. How come a bazillion percentage of these Jews are atheists? And how come a bazillion percentage of these Muslims are fundamentalists? Like this is like polar opposites. And yet we're supposed to be the closest to each other theologically. So this is an example of how it's one thing to talk about our faiths in theory. And it's another thing to talk about the way the folk, the way the civilization has evolved when the rubber meets the road. So I say this as the not as the non-member of the clergy here, um, who maybe observes some earth, some other things um, than the clergy might. But Andra, um, your hand is up uh, and you are muted. Please unmute yourself. Okay, thank you. <laughs> This has really been very interesting because we're really opening up the Torah and uh, for a lot of discussion and uh, hearing. I love the, the concept of the guardians versus those that are prophetic. Um, uh, I, you know, hum humans progress. <laughs> humans progress in consciousness. And when we progress in consciousness, we look at life differently. And so that's the reason why I appreciate uh, when, when Judaism changes, it holds the same basic values, love, kindness, compassion, uh, thoughtfulness, caring about others, but it shows up differently as we're, we're here in 2022. Um, I, I know that Dan will probably be in alignment with me with this in terms of sacrifice and the sacrifice of animals. Um, that was needed at a certain point in time for human beings, perhaps long ago, uh, who were riddled with guilt and felt that, you know, sacrificing an animal, you know, assuaged their guilt uh, or, or whatever was done uh, in, in the Torah at one time. 
And Gila, I'm not familiar with everything that's in Leviticus, but I believe that they do say references for sacrifice are in Leviticus, and that there are some people who are the guardians, so to speak, uh, who are waiting for the temple to be built again to continue with the sacrifice of animals. But um, uh, one of the things, uh, Mike, I'm going to reel you into this that he mentioned, uh, because there's an uh, there's a particular uh, holiday in Islam called Eid, Eid el Adha. Uh, where um, animals are sacrificed, you know, to to remember that time when Abraham was uh, asked to kill his son and sacrifice his son. And Mike actually made a video. Do you remember, Mike, with the concept of maybe we progress to the point that do we really need to kill animals or is it more important to sacrifice our ego? You know, so there are different ways of looking at this and looking at the concept of sacrifice. Um, and so we've progressed. Uh, I know that when we talk about the death penalty, uh, for some reason, my mind, as you saw in chat, goes back to stoning, you know, and I don't know at that time whether they really had lots of witnesses and people coming forward to say this, they saw this or they saw that. Uh, I know that women were stoned uh, supposedly for adultery. I don't know whether that, I, I don't know what the concept was. Laura brought up that wasn't necessarily adultery, but um, did they know that when they stoned women? <laughs> you know, for what? Uh, and, um, you know, why was stoning done? Uh, and, and what would be the, the reason and the justification for that? And maybe that type of justification wouldn't settle well today, knowing how people are and human beings are today in today's world. So, um, so we've progressed, I think, as a humanity. And I guess sometimes we have to look back on what our core values are at the deepest level, uh, but see how we are to navigate life now using those core values, but maybe uh, questioning as we, as you mentioned, Dan, uh, you know, Judaism does question, uh, you know, how we will view those core values and how we will um, up, uphold them in today's world. Uh, I don't know how uh, uh, Rabbi David or Rabbi Gila will respond to that, but I would appreciate your thoughts on that. Yeah, Andra, thank you so much. These are huge questions and you've raised a really interesting thing. I, I somewhat, um, uh, I, I shy away from that notion that we've come a long way um, whenever that's applied to our ancient history. The, the number of animals that are slaughtered in the most horrific uh, conditions, raised in horrific conditions and slaughtered, it, it so far vastly swamps any kind of sacrificial system in the past, um, which was intended to allow you to eat meat, to allow you to have, have uh, uh, animal food, but but sanctifying it, right? Recognizing that you've taken a life uh, and sanctifying that life. And so it was a whole different idea than when we go into a supermarket and see the the the, the shells full of body parts that uh, you know that modern society has. I mean, our, our notion of what's acceptable vis-a-vis -vis the animal world mm. is is just. Oh my gosh. Okay, don't get me started on that. Um, on the death penalty, you know, there was, yes, there was stoning in the in the Torah. And women were uh, were um, adulterous if they were married and had sexual relations outside the marriage. They were um, considered adulterous, uh, as was a man who had sexual relations with a married woman. Uh, uh, so there was stoning for that. Um, you know, it's a horrific way to carry out the death penalty, but I think most of us agree that death penalties are 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 um, outside the pale of what should be allowed. Um, but we we live in a society that still has death penalties. Um, go to death penalty action uh, on the internet to, to raise your voice against. The, the actually cruel way in which death, death penalties are carried out in different states still um, and, on, and on a constant basis. Um, so uh, the rabbis, as, as David mentioned, the rabbi, yeah, at Texas, Oklahoma, there's still quite a few states. Um, 
the rabbi softened this. So a, uh, a, a court, the Sanhedrin that allowed for it, a single execution was called the killing court. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it was that, you know, that uh, rare and that unusual. They made it almost impossible to have a death penalty um, implemented. So there was a real softening from the, the situation in the Torah. Thank you. If I, if I can ask uh, one of our panelists, in any of the Jewish movements today, is, is there discussions by the board or, you know, votes or whatever about, um, about going vegetarian, you know, completely? Does that come up? I mean, I've heard the term echo kosher, but that could just be some individual's um, term for it. But I think it's safe to say that we no longer live in a society where we need to eat meat in order to get our basic nutrients. Um, I don't know if I'm an example in terms of health. I'm not. I mean, I've got a doctor's appointment tomorrow, but I've been a vegan for 30 years. Um, so, you know, I'm not dead yet. Um, <laughs> but um, is that something that's coming up in rabbinical circles? And there's also vegan rabbis. There are a large yeah. grouping of vegan rabbis that actually refer back to the Torah, you know, speaking about uh, the concept of uh, animals and eating animals. And were they really given to us to have dominion over them or were they given to us to kill them and eat them? <laughs> so my, my question was more just in, in, not to be rhetorical, but just factually, is this something that is coming up in any of the movements in Judaism where there are actually votes about having the movement um, embrace vegetarianism. I won't even use the word veganism. Got to start baby steps. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just to comment, uh, I don't know if there has been, you know, uh, uh, specific conversations in any of the rabbinical movements about, um, you know, uh, you're, you're saying to, uh, in support of uh, vegetarianism or veganism. I mean, it is, you know, in the Torah, as, you know, as Andra uh, mentioned in, in, chap in the first chapter, the, the diet of the human, the human diet is to be vegetarian, uh, fruitarian, eat of the vegetation, the fruits of the trees, you know, and, uh, you know, and the kashrut or the uh, uh, later on after the flood, you know, there's injunction to, you know, okay, to eat flesh. I mean, a lot of this has, is rooted in the nature of, you uh, uh, of an agrarian society, you know, uh, where people, you know, uh, had to do things that, you know, probably were not uh, the ideal in order to survive. In Judaism, you know, the essence of kashrut has to do with kind of letting letting the blood, you know, out of the of the animal in the slaughtering process because the blood represents the soul. Let the blood return to the earth. And then also in the um, very strict ways in which uh, was, uh, slaughter, or slaughter, or slaughter. Um, I mean, I've been to slaughtering houses and, uh, and close to 50 years ago, I stopped eating red meat, so I went together. But, um, you know, so there's, there's a growing consciousness about that in the Jewish community. Rabbinic associations, you know, they're not coming, uh, and, and what do called halacha, they're the Jewish law committees, as far as I know, have not um, debated, you know, issuing issuing some kind of a takana, an enactment, you know, on on, uh, uh, on 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 how the people should refrain from eating meat altogether. Um, there's, um, you know, the, in the kosher industry, there is, you know, there is kind of a there is a consciousness. I mean, people know that, uh, you know, caged uh, chickens are not, you know, um, part of. Uh, our ethical way, uh, our way of slaughtering chickens, and neither, um, you know, uh, injecting the animals with antibiotics, and uh, you know, and what else do they get? Gosh, I mean, it doesn't. That's different, you know. It's it's it is different. I, you know, what can I say? Uh, it's it's it should be discussed, perhaps, but it, for an, an organization to. And there is a movement. There is a Jewish vegetarian movement, and we've also had Jewish vegetarians several times at our retreat center. And our retreat center is a vegetarian facility, but um, a vegetarian slash dairy. But uh, it uh, there. So there are groups of Jews that have this, you know, rising consciousness. Um, there's a um, oh, uh, oh, I forget his name. But he's written tremendous 
amount of material, but there's a lot about this. Richard Schwartz. Richard, thank you. <laughs> a lot about this. And we also sponsored a conference here in Washington about 20 years ago on uh, Judaism and vegetarianism with mm -hmm. Richard Schwartz as the keynote speaker. So there's a, there's a consciousness about it within the Jewish world. But uh, as far as a rabbinic, uh, a rabbinic body coming down and making a takana and a, a law, you know, as we've done with other kinds of things over time. I mean, um, you know, in the Ashkenazic world in Judaism, I mean, polygamy was uh, was was ruled, outruled, you know, in the Middle Ages by uh, Rabbi Gershon, you know, from, uh, was it Germany uh, or Austria? You know, that was the Middle Ages, you know, and, um, and there are other things, you know, women's rights, you know, for property rights in the Torah. There's a serious problem with, the, you know, women were not allowed to own property, you know, mm -hmm. in the Torah. Well, the the daughters of Tzalafchad, a loyal follower of Moses, you know, went uh, went to uh, went to Moses. Uh, he died, and the daughters went to uh, Moses to complain. This is not right. They said, "This is not right that we can't uh, inherit our father's property." You know, so Moses excused himself. He had a conversation with God. God said to Moses, "Get it right. Change the law." <laughs> So within that's one example of how even within the context of the most sacred teachings, you know, uh, which and by the way are sacred teachings, as as many Jews see it, including including some uh, more traditional Jewish scholars over time, you know, evolved. I mean, it didn't all happen at one at one moment. It took several hundred years before our Tanakh, our Hebrew Bible, was was canonized. It took several hundred years. You know, and, uh, and and people forget things. Was, everything was given at Mount Sinai. That's not the case. And there are many authors. Many authors. It's not this. It's not. I know this is different. Different in the way Muslims, as I understand, perceive the origin of the Quran. But you know, for most Jews, including you know Orthodox Jews who, you know, who uh, uh, who who study Talmud, you know, they'll see how these uh, texts that we have. You know, there were successive, you know, generations that can continue that process. Uh, Gila, do you have any further comment on that? Uh... So uh, just, a, uh, just a word about this. So I would say that the problem is for all the things that um, Kashrut, Jewish kosher laws, are not, you know, can be criticized or are not where we would like them to be. Uh, the, the people who feel that way in the progressive world, non-Orthodox world, don't keep kosher, so it doesn't really matter to them enough to change those laws. And for the people who do keep kosher um, and uh, are traditional, there is no real way to change those laws. There's no obvious way. There's no central authority, um, and there's no process that, that really is easy to get those laws changed. Um. So I thought maybe I, Nora, I appreciate your your question about maybe addressing questions that I asked, but maybe we can do that after small groups. I want to give everybody an opportunity in a small group to maybe share some personal perspectives or personal stories that have shaped your idea of these values. And we don't have to spend more than 15 minutes doing it, but I think maybe we can, I'm going to stop, uh, pause the recording. We, we just heard that we had an all Muslim well, all the Muslims who are here were placed in the same group. I assure you that was not intentional. That's what I mentioned. Yeah. I mentioned it was random. Yeah, we were all children. Mara, I mean, <clears throat> you are now perpendicular to the rest of us. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> uh, <laughs> wow. I don't know either. <laughs> oh, so it's, good to have a, it's good to have a different perspective. <laughs> That's Maybe. called thinking thinking outside the box. There you okay. go. Oh, she fixed it. Good for you. Yeah, I had kept it horizontal, my cell phone. And so now I changed it for placed it vertical. So I wish we could share our perspectives so easily and change them that way. That's amazing, yeah. Humar. Good point. Do, do you, is there a spokesperson from each group that we, we have you know, that Dr. many groups that maybe you can share some ideas from, from Dr. Ali is our Dr. Ali is our share uh, person. Okay. okay, please. Oh, you want me to go first? All right. Yes, please. We, we, um, we discussed regarding that um, issue about uh, animal sacrifice, which uh, one of the members had brought in. 
Um, and we said that um, unanimously, all of all three of us were of the opinion that Rabbi Gila did a fantastic job of answering that. You know, that uh, commercially, the um, a large number of animals are sacrificed in that too, in a very horrendous way, and all that, and uh, to eat the meat. And uh, whereas the our tradition of uh, Eid al-Adha in the footsteps of uh, our beloved prophet Ibrahim uh, or Abraham uh, that you say, um, we do it to eat the meat and um, in the most sanctimonious way as she has put it, you know, in a very clean, good food. And that too, we only eat, take one third of it for eating, not, not to throw it away or anything, but to eat. And the two thirds of it, we share with others, with the family and for the poor, you know, so other members, family, friends, and for the poor, two thirds of it in the tradition of our beloved prophet, Ibrahim. Uh, so um, people need to be educated on that. This is actually a good thing that the poor people are being given the meat, which lamb they, they hardly ever eat, you know, it's so expensive when we do that. So anyway, that was one point we discussed uh, that we were very appreciative of the way uh, Rabbi Gila um, uh, explained it. Then uh, the second point we said was uh, upon your comment that you made saying that an enormous number of uh, uh, Jews are atheist and an enormous number of Muslims are fundamentalist. Um, so the point uh, Mike Ross and Noor made is uh, gave that 0.001% are, are that. I, I would say enormous number of Muslims are traditional Muslims. We practice the same core values of universal brotherhood of humanity, dignity, oneness of God, oneness of humanity, kindness, charity, justice. So we do that. But a particular small, very small percentage is the fundamentalist and out of that smaller percentage is ready. That's, those were the two mm -hmm. points. Thank you. And, and just thank you. And just to be clear, when I made that statement, I was not talking about the way, Jew, the way the Jews in the room or the Muslims in the room treat other people. I was purely speaking about their theology. So to give numbers, roughly a third of Jewish people in America today would, would say they do not believe even in a higher power. Roughly a third might be viewed as believing in a higher power um, creator separate from the universe that was created, who, who created in accordance with an omnibenevolent will. And then there's a third that believe in a higher power, but they don't believe in that, in that concept. So that's, the, that's what like poll numbers show. Um, I was I was simply commenting about a particular group of people who were there at a particular session to, to illustrate just how different our groups tend to be from one another, even though our, you know, the faith's theologies are so similar. Yes. Um, okay, can we hear from an, the, another group, a representative of another group? I'll, I'll go. So um, a couple of folks in our group were talking about how um, in, internally, we know what's right and wrong. That's natural. Um, and then that brought to my mind the idea of conscience. And um, I raised the issue of how conscience often is counteracted by ego. And people were talking about, well, we need to learn what's right and wrong um, or learn how to bring out that inner knowledge um but i was suggesting that if we we learn how to subdue the ego then the conscience can come forward um because if we have to learn what's right and wrong that suggests that right and wrong is culturally relative <clears throat> but i think we all know that there universally there are certain ideas about what's right and wrong you don't kill you don't lie you don't steal I mean, that's found in every religion, in every culture. Um, and things like the golden rule, that's like a universal also. So 
I think that's innate to the human nature, but ego gets in the way of actually putting that into action. I think, Laura, also one of the things we talked about uh, that uh, particularly Salaluddin mentioned is that uh, when we talk about how were our virtues um, uh, created, or let's say um, uh, choreographed maybe, uh, would be um, that listening to one's elders, at least that was for him, listening to his grandmother, listening to his aunts, uh, all of that, growing up in, uh, uh, in a situation where there was a lot of violence during the years that he was younger really affected him. And so seeing that and then having, uh, uh, you know, his, his background of listening to the, the elders and the wisdom that they brought forth really helped him become the human being that he is today. Um, so I think that that also um, uh, is important. Uh, I brought up the concept of mysticism uh, and how that um, affected me in a deeper way uh, to uh, appreciate the values uh, in a deeper sense uh, from a mystical uh, framework. And Gila, do you have anything you want to add to what we did? Okay. So Rev. Thank David, you, no problem. Rev. David, do you want to share something or should I share my point? It's muted. It was really, it was, it was Dan and myself uh, mainly. Um, uh, we didn't, um, uh, so we had a conversation between ourselves and uh, I, I don't remember any particular highlights um, of the conversation, uh, but I really appreciate your, you know, your questions and, and uh, you know, and how, how you... Oh, well, let, let me say something. I, I came in very late because okay. I had a, a conflict, but I was struck by, by the energy that certainly Dan and David have brought to, to Jewish life and the, the richness you both must feel in setting in motion an opportunity for people to grow in their respective religious traditions and in understanding the broader religious worlds in which uh, they share space and time. Um, and again, we're, we're all indebted in ways we don't even know. Well, you'll feel less indebted when I make this point because um, I want to be provocative. So just before you arrived, I, I shared what I consider to be both, you know, both an opportunity and a, and a, and a challenge. It's kind of, maybe sobering. Um, so I've written about my own kind of development in terms of how I became religious, theologically, right? And I don't wanna talk about that. I wanna go back earlier in time when I was a much more sort of typical, you know, 1960s young Jewish boy um, who didn't think much of going to services, who didn't think much of going to Jewish school. Mostly I thought about football during Jewish school. Um, and, um, Yet I had a Jewish consciousness. Yet it was very important to me to have that Jewish sense of identity. Why? Because I associated with certain values. What values? This deep commitment to education. This general sense of being, you know, fighting for the underdog, fighting, you know, fighting for the have-nots as opposed to the haves. All sorts of people who go into public service or social work, you know, whatever, th those kinds of occupations. Like we had a ton of people in my family who did that. And, and it was in growing up in Bethesda, I mean, there's so many people who work, parents work for NIH. It was like almost like a college town um, and government employees and whatnot who didn't work for NIH, um, including my parents. So I had that sense of Jewish values that sort of set Jews apart in my mind. And now I fast forward to today. Um, I don't think any, I don't hear anybody talking about the Jews' commitment to education compared to, to all other groups. I mean, you know, I, I, in, Ber they're not, in Berkeley, they're not trying to keep the Jews out anymore. There are other certain other groups they're trying to keep out, right? Or Harvard. Um, when it comes to values, I mean, I can go to a Unitarian Universalist church and hear progressive values constantly. And I don't have to hear about, you know, people bashing Israel. So I, I, I don't see the Jewish um, civilization, if you will, separated out 
from this in this values sense from the general society in the 2020s as much as I did say in the 1960s. And I would think it would make it more of a challenge for those families who wanted to give their children a sense of Jewish identity, but maybe don't connect so much with ritual or don't, con or don't go to shul as much. How do they keep the flame lit? It was, I think, easier back then than maybe it is now. Yeah, you know, I've had a lot of college students um, who they tell me one of their parents was raised Jewish. And that's the end of it. Once you have that marriage between the Jew and the non-Jew, the, the Jewish identity inevitably is, is no longer passed down. I've had a few exceptions, but, um, and oh. so that, that, I mean, that's something I think is maybe uniquely American, I don't know. But um, it's kind of a shame. And one thing that came to my mind a lot earlier in our conversation was what <laughs> a folk value of the Jews. And I think family fits that. Education and truth. Statistically, <clears throat> American Jews are much more highly educated than other religious groups in America. Um, but family also. And that's why even if you're not religious, if you're atheist, you still identify with Judaism as a culture, as a family heritage. Just like to Thank you. Go, go ahead, Rob David. Go ahead. Uh, I mean, I, I think I see it and I've experienced uh, differently than than you. I uh, I work a lot with um, a lot of fam with families with individuals who are not uh, connected or haven't been connected for a long time with the Jewish community. Um, and um, over the years, uh, been helping those individuals and those couples, those families uh, find find connections. Um, part of what um, our community has done over the past number of years, we've helped to incubate uh, new Jewish groups, um, and this is an emer a tremendous emergence of young people uh, trying to find their way within the Jewish world. Um, um, many different levels spiritually but also um, in terms of how to respond to the issues that we are facing in our society i can you know r rattle off maybe 10 you know 10 new groups that have emerged over the past 10 10 just 10 years uh, alone you know and um so I, uh, I i i do see it differently with intermarriage yeah it's a challenge but um gosh i've uh, i i do a lot of over the years a lot of b'nai mitzvah be mitzvah, b'nai mitzvah, bat mitzvah, you know, and uh, and also officiate at uh, various uh, events, baby namings, funerals that involve almost always non-Jews, you know, and um, I see, I see that there is a, uh, there's an interest, there's a desire to be connected, and how that connection, how those connections are made, you know, is, uh, is a challenge. You know, and that's something that uh, our community is trying to address. So I, you know, I see it a little bit differently than you do. I'm much more positive, uh, feel, I have a positive feeling about the... Uh, about well, we're, we're in two very different settings. I'm in the public setting and you're coming out of, as a rabbi, out of a synagogue setting. No, you're I'm not in a synagogue setting. Oh, oh, okay, I'm sorry. Um, you know, yeah, but I mean, I'm in the community. I'm in the community, and I'm pretty, pretty public. It's not uh, a traditional synagogue at all. Um, the communities that I've served over the years have all been alternative Jewish communities. Ah, uh, alternative Jewish communities. So you do you what the people you see are coming to your Jewish community mm -hmm. because they want to identify with Judaism to some degree. What I'm seeing in the public college is the general population. Okay. So, and I, I have seen many, many more every semester, every year, more and more Muslims in my classes. I could count on one hand the number of Jews I've had in classes over the past 25 years. And mm -hmm. perhaps a few more of those who would I don't identify as Jewish, but they will say they're 
dad was Jewish or something along those lines, but they really don't know anything about it. They don't learn anything about it. They don't identify as Jewish because it's not passed down to them. Um, Laura, I'm sorry I, I couldn't come for the better part of this discussion. Uh, where are you, which university are you connected oh, with? I'm at NOVA. I teach at NOVA. At Northern, where? Northern Virginia Community College. Oh, okay, okay. I just want to ask you about the Chabad imprint. That seems to have been a catalyst in a number of settings for people to want to learn more. Are they active where you are, Chabad? No, nah, the, the, the community college doesn't um, have religious groups the way like George Mason does, but mm -hmm. the community college, it's the community that we're not a campus, you know, the, the activities our students are involved in are so widespread, work and family and friends, and and they don't hang around the campus to get involved in groups like that. So I, I feel very Talmudic in making this statement, but I think there's value in both what Laura and David are saying. I think <laughs> there is plenty of truth in what in what you both are saying with your own respective yeah. perspectives. What I will say to Laura though about about the products of intermarriage is that you need to go to the to see the rabbi at Hill Havara and talk not only about her background, she's my daughter, but also the statement that they make every um, on the high holidays, just the most heartfelt expression of love for the non-Jewish spouse or member of the family that um, brings their children and whatnot to the to the community. It almost brings me to tears every year. Nor. You um, yeah, you I, have a, a uh, comment? Yeah, yeah. I have a question, really, so that I can understand from you guys. Sure, the, yeah. country, the country today is polarized, means has formed two tribes, Democrat tribe and Republican tribe. <laughs> I mean, that's that's the facts. Looking the numbers, so how do you see this polarization? and the impact of the polarization to the Jewish community. Well, very Can I just say, first of all, isn't this the weekend where the conservative Jews are having all these speakers is in, in Vegas? Isn't that happening now? Anyway, yeah. go ahead, uh, Rabbi David or uh, Rabbi Gila. No, it's a serious, it is a serious problem. This. I'm afraid I have to go. I'm oh, so and, and, and you're not late, and maybe this will be the last, yeah. David, okay. Rabbi, Rabbi David, this will be the last word, because right. it's we're now over time. Bye, thank you, Rabbi Thank Gila. you so much. Thank you. You know, we're we're all deeply concerned about the polarization in general in the Jewish community. It's definitely gotten worse. Um, it's always been uh, there. Um, you know, because you can't be a Jewish community without having a number of different opinions about things. And um, but it's it's gotten you know very uh, much more difficult. You know, with um, you know organizations that are supporting you know, Jewish organizations supporting Republican candidates because of their, uh, it's mainly their support for Israel with uh, disregarding, you know, uh, their, their inconsideration for women's reproductive rights and, and other, you know, many other issues, including gun, 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 gun reform, etc. So it is a problem in the Jewish community. And uh, there are those of us who are trying to figure out how to address it. Um, you heard a conversation, was it last week, uh, that you sponsored over um, this definition of anti semitism A week and a half ago. A week and a half ago. A week and a half ago already? Well, um, I mean, it's a serious issue, uh, you know, who speaks for the Jewish community, you know, and, um, and this polarization, how do we deal with it? Now, these are intra, you know, religious or intra... Intra-faith, intra-faith. Intra -faith, that's the word, intra-faith issues. Muslims have to also address their intra-faith issues. Oh yeah, and and we have to address ours. Um, I uh, and and we're trying. Some of us are trying to figure out how to do that. It's um, you know in a in a civil way, and uh, that can you know that's that's the issue. There are organizations popping up, by the way, you know where Democrats and Republicans are getting together. There's a is braver what's it called braver angels braver, braver angels braver angels. That's a good example. They just, they just, David, they had a workshop yesterday. It's very good. Yeah. So I've been following them. I get there. I, I, I'm on their mailing list. Um, and that's, and there are other organizations very similar that have just popped up over the past couple of years. You know, that, that, that is next. That's, I feel hopeful about that. 
You know, we have to encourage that dialogue. We have to meet face to face more often. Now that COVID is, uh, or the pandemic anyway, is coming to uh, something of a close, I guess. I don't know. Um, but people are feeling more comfortable getting together in person. Uh, we need to do that. We need to get back to dialogue, you know, dialoguing with each other. For a couple, two, almost two and a half years, we had dialogue groups. Some of you may have participated in them in Montgomery County. Uh, we, we, can, we, there were 20 of us who said that were trained to lead these dialogue groups between different segments of the population on racism, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, etc. We had from 40, the largest group was 100 people came out. And uh, basically, uh, it, it, it stopped. It, it, uh, we wanted to continue it, but uh, uh, we lost one of our leaders and, uh, and then the pandemic uh, came in. That's what we need to do. We need to do you know, work on the ground face to face. That's how I feel about it. Okay. So we're a little after time. I want to thank all of you for giving us uh, up to two hours and in some cases more than two hours of your time today. Um, we will put this on the uh, JIDS website in a few days. And um, we look forward to doing the same kind of thing, only instead of Judaism, we'll be looking at Islam either um, in December or January. It's always a hard month to schedule things. So either December or January. And again, I want to thank our panelists doing a wonderful job as always. And, uh, you, you know, don't, don't, uh, Come back, come back many times, David. And thank and, you, Gila. And thank you, Dan uh, and Jiz, for doing this. It's wonderful, wonderful work. Thank you. So important. Take care, everybody. See you. Uh, Good to see you. Thank you.